We're going to move into our afternoon session, and we have a fresh face and a couple of familiar faces here for our decolonizing panel. Ooh, decolonizing. Oh, man. Decolonizing public art specifically, right? Um, I spent some time with some members of the uh, in Indigenous Governance Program out of UVic who insisted I decolonize through reading books. And, you know, books are great. I love books. Um, but action, right? And what, what, what do we do, right? What are the little things that we do? And I, I just want to acknowledge those little things that we do. You know, allyship, participation, active listening. Active listening, listening with your heart and your mind is decolonizing because thinking with just our brains, it causes problems. So we're going to hear, uh, we're going to hear from these individuals over the next half hour or so and on the topic of decolonizing art in the city. Uh, Corey, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, briefly and speak to our topic today. That'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, my name is Corey Douglas. Uh, I'm a Squamish Nation member with Haida and Simshian Ancestry. Um, this is a really interesting topic. Um, I, I started my journey as a cultural consultant through the public arts. Um, I've since moved on to cultural consulting in the architectural and building industry. And uh, you know, it's been a really interesting proposition uh, as far as a discussion. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't even know where to begin with this. You know, it's, it has been a, a, a tough topic, again, to, to uh, engage with. You know, it's, it's not without hesitation, fear, um, hesitancy. And, you know, I, I think just even opening up and ad admitting that this is an area uh that that needs to be discussed um public art has somehow accepted any form of our cultural identity as public art uh you know that's a topic all on its own you know anything that is of cultural relevance to a community to a family again, is deemed as public art. My question is, is that appropriate? And I can kind of answer some of those questions uh, just briefly here. The public art community, again, has adopted any form of our cultural relevance. And typically we have non-Indigenous professionals assigning a monetary value to public art. And now we have those same non-Indigenous people assigning a monetary value to our forms of cultural identity. And I, I use one particular person as an example. Um, it's someone that has done, has found a high level of success in the public art realm. It's uh, Douglas Copeland. Um, you know, we have, in the public arts community, we have celebrated uh, him in many different ways. Um, I've used him as a reference to better understand what my own monetary worth is when going through the public art, uh, propositioning my own public art to be uh, a part of a project. And the immediate response was, I'm too expensive. So, you know, now we're getting into the depths of decolonizing. You know, and the big thing is, is the big question I have as part of that decolonization is what is the monetary worth of our identity? I'll pass the mic. <laughs> Maybe that's not necessarily a question for us to answer here, but you know, these are, these are kinds of the questions that I, I think that develop over the time of, of, of engagement. Do you want to go? Or? I think I can walk. Yeah, go ahead. All right. 
Well, everybody came back after lunch. That's a good sign. Um, so again, my name is Brandon Gabriel from Kuala Nation. And uh, Corey, I think I think you touched on uh, a really important topic. And um, I mean, if, if I can just talk like a little bit about what my journey was like. I remember uh, leaving Emily Carr back in like 2006. Um, and I, and at that time, I, I don't recall there being a professional studies class that talked about contract law or uh, any of any anything like that. And people wonder why when artists leave art school, they go broke. It's well, they don't. They actually don't have business classes in some of them. And that was the case certainly when I left there. But I also recall at that time, the city of Vancouver had not really developed. Um, at least as far as I understood it, a, a public art policy that was centered around Indigenous art production. Um, I remember, you know, there was always the city, like the banner designs. Um, there was always, what I found a, a lot, what, what there was a lot of, where there would be an entire building would be designed, the entire landscape around that building had this this design, but I also remember there was like this postmodern, like this postmodern concept of minimal, like a minimal aesthetic, where to be multicultural is to take away any semblance of any culture anywhere, and everything is reduced to these blank rectangles. Or if we were lucky, it would have a slope on it, and it kind of looked like a bit like a triangle. But then sometimes it would be subdivided and subdivided and subdivided to a bunch of rectangles. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, look right there. Yeah, yeah. Look at, I mean, we are surrounded by rectangles. It sucks. I, you know, okay. It's so annoying that that's the answer to being multicultural. To, to take away any semblance of any human activity in the space in its entirety, to the point where it's just robotic. It's just a robot infused space, devoid of any semblance of culture or history, let alone it being a space that is, is acknowledging that it's on stolen indigenous land, heaven forbid. And so I, I, I remember getting these early, these call outs uh, when I graduated and they wanted, one of the rectangles to be filled in with an, with an indigenous design. And it was just a little rectangle, like that little strip there in an entire space. And they wanted to give the artist $300 for it. And I thought, wow, this is four years of university. This is what I, this is what I can expect now coming out of it and in, in my hometown. Is that what we get? Yep. Okay, fast forward almost 20 years later, and it's still the same. They're still giving that $300, the $300 honorarium to the artist in the same, the spaces that are all still designed the same way. And it has changed significantly. There have been significant changes. There have been consistent uh, efforts to bring in a, a different model that allows for more creativity for Indigenous artists to bring in their stories and tell the story in this space. But predominantly what, we, what I see is the entire design is done and we just get the little spots at the very end of the project. And we've had absolutely no say in the design of it, no say in what that space is gonna look like, but we do it at the very end. And when we talk about money, it's, it's garbage. Like I, I, I looked, uh, I looked to, the, there, there, there's a project that I'm doing. I don't live here anymore. I live on Vancouver Island. There's a project that required four weeks of work, solid work for me to come into the city to do the work. So I priced out, okay, well, what's going to cost me to rent a place for a month? And well, I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to go, I, I won't look on the West End or anything. Let's just go look in Van, East Vancouver, maybe. And it's like for like a two bedroom, it's like $6,000. Uh, for one month. Meanwhile, the city council is giving me $300 for like one of my designs and then they're going to make me wait two months to get paid for it. 
Yeah, it's a joke. Um, and so like, yeah, I, like, I, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, this is good. I, and yeah. maybe uh, who's going to invite the third yeah. guest to maybe talk a little bit about it. I mean, I can talk all day yeah. about this topic. I I wish we had more time together. Yeah, just uh, just hearing what you're saying, it's like everything relates back to like who we are and where we're from. And like I was saying at the beginning, there's no word for art in our languages, right? It's our way of life. And a lot of our artists, like I'm not a, a carver or a mural artist. Like um, I'm just Christy Lee living out my name as Scaglia on my traditional land, like doing a little bit of this, doing a little bit of that, I guess. Being one of those <laughs> one of those little ladies actually my great grandmother who carried the name before me uh she was known to to go in places and and cause a ruckus and uh you know she'd go out on the floor when uh, work was being done and she'd stop it right away or she'd go behind the curtain that uh you know people aren't supposed to go behind and she'd say hey you can't do this and you can't do that and that's you know that's our way of of living out the name that I carry right so um I do a lot of behind the scenes work. Like um, I've sat on a lot of juries for, for the city of Vancouver, for Canada Council, for uh, First Peoples Cultural Council. And uh, and yeah, and just happened to work you know, like really cool jobs growing up in my community where I had to go around and document our public art or our pieces that are, you know, in BC Place or, you know, in CBC buildings and, <laughs> and you know, oh, who made these manhole covers or who made this mural or who made this carving and, and, um, and yeah, like, it's so beautiful to live in this time to really be able to create this change and like help people understand that it's all connected right like um, we come from generations and generations of of you know we're not just hunters and gatherers right we're we are linguists we're we're carvers we're teachers we're you know architects landscape artists um you know these are things that we've that we've carried out since time immemorial my partner is like fourth generation carver and that's just what he knows how to do right he can go out there and carve a uh a, a, a pole and um and and that's what he knows how to do and but it's crazy how to think that you know we need to put a huge dollar amount on we're so valuable right like these corporations and these agencies and these you know companies who come in and you know put us last on the list like 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 uh, brendan was saying um, you know, it took them millions and millions of dollars to get there, and they still have millions and millions of dollars to spend. And, you know, they if they flew in, you know, some famous artists from, you know, another part of the world, they would pay for their, they would pay for their uh, travel and accommodations and their per diems and, you know, pay for whatever it is that they're asking for. But yet, you know, when they're, sometimes they'll come to me and they're just like, oh, here's your welcome fee. I'm like, no, you got to give me like five times more of that because, you know, this is my job and this is what I do too. I'm not just a, like a, an attraction on the top of your event. It's, a, it's integrating the things that we do into the work that we do. And um, that's a, that's a so much really, I, want to say. I know, right. I know totally. And, <laughs> and I, sorry to interrupt. And okay. I think you touched on a really interesting topic as well as, Honoraria is it's no longer uh, acceptable. You know, yeah. there is there is a, a a requirement prior to a project uh, going out for for public tender, for example. You know, why isn't there a line item associated with Indigenous engagement? You know, it, it's not just public art, and I think that's what we're we're trying to uh, inspire you with. Um, to think outside of this bubble that we're not just artists. Yeah. You know, we are in this time of truth and reconciliation right now. And let's explore what that looks like. Look around. Look around this city. Look around any town that you're in. Any city you're in. There is no Indigenous acknowledgement in the planning of anything architecturally speaking and you know, that is a prime opportunity for a much deeper engagement strategy and commitment 
to activating voice in participation to this process. And I think one of the big things for me was trying to understand and appreciate my value. Again, coming back to the monetary value, what is my worth in this industry? What is my hourly rate? Honoraria is no longer acceptable. What is a, a, a scalable value? And I think that's the big question. I just want to thank you, uh, Corey, for asking the question and, and following that path, the path in the conversation. Um, I'm, an, I'm a working artist too. I have to value myself too. What's my brand? You know, my personality is my brand. My ancestral design that I have rights to is my brand. Right. But this brings to mind um, one of the challenges that's listed on the back wall. You know, we're talking about decolonizing art in the city, and the focus went to money and value. And so when we're talking to one another, actively having, you know, we're doing a relationship building exercise, we don't get to pick and choose the struggles that are at the forefront of our relationship. And unfortunately, the struggle has continued to this day and you have inherited the struggle. We have inherited a struggle, you have inherited a struggle. So we sit together and we acknowledge the difficulties in that struggle and we start listening First comes the difficulties, then comes a bit of acknowledgement of the struggle. We acknowledge that together. Boom, we take a step. Who's to say many generations of living in that struggle is going to be fixed or re remediated in one generation, in one week? And, and we want that. I love that you want that. I love that you want to see results. I want to see results. But these are systemic issues. These are long, historical, entrenched paths. And they're kind of deep. They're like rutted trails. And if you've ever walked in a rutted trail, you're like, oh, I got to get out of the rutted trail. It's really bumpy in there. And then you're kind of walking, straddling the rutted trail looking at it like, man, that's a problem. So we're gonna talk about the problems and the issues again and again until we acknowledge them and say, yes, let's move forward. What can we do about this? And it's hard just to get to that point. Sometimes it's hard just to get to that point. Brandon? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there, there's another uh, issue that comes to mind. Um, where like there's a where organizations or governments form an indigenous advisory or an indigenous jury like a selection committee um and what i'm what i'm seeing and i've 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 walked into rooms to audition my work to, to be put on display in a competition with other artists and it's the same adjudicator sitting on like 10 different committees and that person has been there for like 30 years. And I've never, like for those competitions where I've actually had to face that person, I've, I've never been selected for work. I've never gotten work out of it. And so, and I've looked at my work and I, I, I'm like, okay, well, that's maybe that's just the luck of the draw. Maybe that's, it's not what they want. I understand that. I can have a sense of, you know, that sort of, fairness and that there's other people in the room who uh, with other stories to tell that story might fit well with what they're trying to do but when you when you come up against it like on um, by the eighth time for me this year well I, i'm starting to question whether that's a, a fair system and um i i don't think we can have that i, I mean like if, if if i were to like look at my own name like my own community of Kwantlen, 
when there was a conflict or something that needed to be resolved or a matter that needed to be handled with care, our people would, would uh, request the assistance of a member of another neighboring community to come in and mediate and be the person to stand in between to, 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 to help adjudicate the process. But never did we ever hire the same person over and over and over and over again, because sooner or later, those people form bonds with other people in the community, and then it's not neutral. It's actually, they're part of, they're part of this, like, and there are divisions. There are divisions with, that exist within the communities that have been there for a long time, and those divisions play out. And I mean, like, um, in addition to, to being an art, an art person, I'm also an elected band council member in my nation. And the, the dividing line in between, between the community members is insane. Like there, there, are, there are some conflicts that are so intense that one, one group of people cannot even sit in the same room with another without somebody coming in to mediate the space. <laughs> and the, it, it, has to, it comes down to another person coming in from outside the group. Um, and so, but it, it's never the same. It's never the same uh, person adjudicating. It's always different. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. We still have 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and there's, I mean, this is the kind of topic we could. We're out of time. Yeah, no, this, <laughs> is, the kind of, this is the kind of topic so we can keep full of hearing of about meal time. I'm like, oh, I think we need to cut it off. No. So we're looking <laughs> forward, right? We're, we're looking forward. Yeah. And, and we're also not forgetting the history and the past and the present and all, you know, all in all, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a vision, right? And we're here, we're talking together. Um, Christy Lee and, yep. and Corey. Sure. For sure. Thanks. I just like um, just taking in what everyone's saying and just like thinking about how each and every one of you, you know, you all come from different representations, like of your own cultural background, but also of your place of work and, you know, the seats that you get to fill and the voices that you get to use, you know, to help create this change, like we've been encouraging to through all this whole symposium. But it's also like, we're out here doing this because we like to do this, right? This is, this is our path. This is what we chose you know, but there are, you know, so many more, there's hundreds and thousands of other Indigenous people from our hundreds, from our community, there's not thousands of us anymore. Thanks, Mopas. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, they're out there just doing this work anyways, like it's winter time, a lot of our families here in coastal territory are going to start traveling around and, you know, stacking our wood and doing our winter ceremonies, and we're out on the land, and like, we're gathering these things that are so important to our way of life, right? Like it's duck hunting season, it's snow goose season, people are out there gathering and preparing for, you know, cultural practices and for feasting and for gifting. And like, these are our ways of life. And when we host, uh, when we host dances or when we host gatherings within our communities, you know, we have you know, this huge thing that we follow where we make sure like, you know, everyone's invited and, you know, representatives from different families are there, our speakers are there, our floor managers, like what we we're talking about before. And I'm like, I'm not going to go on and on and tell you like our formula of, you know, how we take care of each other, but we have these ways and we're very strict and, and we flow these ways together and we always make sure everyone's paid, nobody leaves hungry, you know, nobody leaves cold, you know, if they need a place to stay, we'll put them up. And like, and these are the things that we've been taught since since time immemorial. And I really think it's important that we give space for Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh artists and local artists to, you know, put our markers back on our land, not just because, oh, that artist is so trendy right now. Let's hire them and put their big piece on the wall. Like just recently, I had a conversation with uh, you know, a couple fellow artists of who are friends of mine, who are married into, you know, our family, families as well. Um, they just put up a mural just like up on Dunbar, like just in Musqueam territory. And so many people go by and they're like, what's that Northwest Coast thing doing there? Why is that image there? <laughs> like this should be Musqueam. Because that's how we feel sometimes. And I'm not speaking for everyone, but you know, we do get offended because traditionally, like uh, my good friend, um, 
from Squamish, Marissa and Nahaney. We just did a tour in Stanley Park last week and uh, we, we stopped at Totem Park, you know, so cool, see all these totems. Uh, but, you know, there are huge misrepresentations of this land, right? And in 2010, um, you know, Susan Point put up her entrance ways and they reflect our Salish woodcutting styles, the colors we use, our ancestors, our traditional food, our ceremonies. Um, you know, our weavings, you know, and that's, it's public art, but all those three things carry all, the, like everything I just listed carries who we are, where we're from, our connection to this land. And um, she was saying like, you know, sometimes when we would go put up a pole in somebody else's territory, we're claiming war, or we're claiming land and, you know, and that's kind of what it is to me sometimes. I'm like, what the heck? What's this big Haida thing? I love Haida's my partner's Haida, by the way. <laughs> it's all good now. <laughs> but I'm like, what's this big Haida? <laughs> what's this big Haida poll doing right here? Like, like for me, honestly, when the truth and reconciliation poll went out up in UBC, I was like, what the fuck is happening here? Excuse my language. But like for years and years and years, um, you know, we've been under this understanding, like, you know, your guys are over here, we're over here, we protect our land, you protect your land, we have our ways, you have our ways. And then like thousands of hiatus came and danced and, you know, brought their blankets and put their down down. And I'm like, shit, this is like, in a way a victory because colonization opened up the floor and said, hey, this is what we do when it's not what we do. And we had conversations in our community and, you know, and we always do. We always go back to our community and say, what the heck are they doing out there? And we come back out here and we politely say, hey, you guys can't do that. <laughs> right. So this is this is just my one perspective as a Salish woman from Musqueam, from Squamish, from Tsleil-Waututh, from these lands, like living on these lands and like also um just to create the stuff I want to create, like if I want to weave a blanket or if I want to weave some cedar, you know, like everything's developed, you know, I'm, I'm like, there's other communities like Squamish Nation, you know, Squamish, they live up on the mountainside, they have so much, you know, land, they can go and harvest berries and harvest nettles and, you know, there's elk and deer and all these kinds of beautiful things. Same with where Carrie Lynn's from. And I'm sorry, I'm not too familiar with Kwantlen. I haven't been out that side for a while. I'm kind of stuck here. But uh, but you guys have so much access to, you know, the land. Whereas me, I get to go out right here and this is my traditional water way, right? Like, you know, it's full of boats and pollution and people watching me from the high rises and and all that kind of stuff. So you know, and we have agreements where we're supposed to go over to Kwantlen and harvest and go over to, you know, somewhere else and harvest. But I'm like, heck, heck with that. I'm going to Stanley Park and I'm going to strip some cedar and I'm going to pick some medicine and you guys aren't going to tell me what to do. And if I go to like Jericho Beach to harvest, you know, berries or whatever, I'll have people reaching across me like, oh, that's a nice salmon berry. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm here with my daughters. You know, this is our inherent right to the land. Can you please disrupt? Can you please stop disrupting, you know, this generational teaching that I'm trying to pass on because we are hanging out in a public park with tourists who just think it's great. So that's just, uh, that's where my frustrations come from. But it's like, I'm just so thankful that, you know, if we don't have the land and the language and the teachings, like even just looking at Carrie Lynn, I was talking to her over lunch and, you know, her carving that she has on her, sorry to point you out, but just the practices that she practices, right? Like, it's not just it's not just us always painting on a wall or a building, you know, you know, we go out on the land and we're curious, like, you know, you know, how do we process this mountain goat wool or, you know, what kind of wood, like she was saying, how do we make pieces that last forever? Like our ancestors did, right? We call this, um, these pieces of evidence or belongings, you know, um, what's it called? Artifacts, right? That we unearth from all these different lands across our territories. And they still last. Like you can still pick up an ads or a stone tool and, you know, chop some wood or cut a salmon. Whereas if you go to the dollar store and buy a knife, it falls apart in like a couple of days, right? So, so we're always going to do this. We're always going to continue to do this. And uh, just like everyone else, you know, you'll come from different lineages and you practice your, your family teachings and, and then you go to work and, you know, we do the same things. We're out here living our cultural lives, but yeah, I don't know. 
I could go on. <laughs> I'm done for now. Thank you. Can I just add just a couple of things? I, the fragmented, like it's a, it's a hard reality. Um, you know, and I, I think one of the most integral, uh, poignant points I like to make when I'm working, um, more specifically in the greater Vancouver region, this is Coast Salish territory. Mm -hmm. It it may not be just specific to one particular nation. It may be shared. And this, I mean, now we're talking about fragmented relationships. You know, now we're having to compete with one another for our own traditional uh, responsibilities to the land. This is a colonial construct. And, you know, now getting into the public art realm, now we have to compete with one another? Mm -hmm. How is, how is that uh, a part of the uh, traditional practices? Now, I didn't grow up with, you know, a, a deeply rooted cultural identity. I found my identity well into my 30s. I was very far removed from my community, my cultural identity. It was doubly reinforced with my grandmother attending the residential school system and then my father. And activating this voice and this, you're, you're, we have three panelists here. For me, I'll speak specifically to me. Activating this voice has been a real struggle. Mm. Sitting up here, finding a high level of confidence in myself to talk about a topic that I was not familiar with. I've only been doing this for four years and it's crazy uh, how informative an indigenous voice can be in participation of a project where you're wanting to explore indigeneity. I think that's maybe one of the things I would love to challenge you with on a future project where you're wanting to bring indigeneity to your project and your process is to activate a voice from a community. We have land acknowledgements out there. And even that's a hot topic. We don't know whose traditional territory your project may fall within, but someone from the community may be able to provide you with the appropriate guidance and support to activate the communities to who you're meant to engage with. Thank you. I, I got one last thing to add to that, what, what you're saying. And I think it's important too. Um, is the, the business practice of uh, where there's a budget, uh, an allocate, like a, a set limit for a budget for a project. And after the budget is set, then everybody sits in the room and says, oh, there's three nations, but we have this one budget. Let's split it up. Okay, so you're gonna split the one budget into three, but then it gets subdivided even further because then each community is like, oh, we get a budget? Well, we have 10 artists here. They all want to have their stuff on display at that in that place. And then the, the next community is like, well, we have like 20. Mm. It's like, well, why don't we just get them all to do it with those budgets? And then, then it gets pared down into these tiny little smaller pieces. But then what, what I've seen, I've seen it, is now that there's all these different artists that are now all on board, the, the, paying, cust the paying customer, the person the people that set out the, the, pro, the project, well, we need to hire a consultant. And not out of this budget. We'll just set up another budget for this consultant. And the consulting budget is like three times whatever that budget was for the Indigenous people. I've seen it. I see it. And it's disgusting. And, and so there's that whole thing. And, and so like, it, it, it like, it's like, okay, well, if you're going to, if you're going to have a budget for one artist and then you decide, well, you're going to need three, then you should times it by three, not divide by three times it by three. Hmm. Why not? And so, you know, those, those things are commonplace. It's common practice, but then, you know, there's this other side to that too, where, where there'll be a budget, let's say it's $3 million for a poll to be raised here, let's just say hypothetically. Well, it's they're gonna they're gonna drop 2.5 million dollars on on engineering and consulting, 
and give the leftover to the artist, but that artist isn't going to see that 500,000. They're only going to get 50,000 of it. And their artist team is going to be however many people. And then we're going to give them like 15% of that payout when they do the contract and they get the rest six months later after the last, uh, last brushstroke was put on it. And meanwhile, you know, the consulting firm, the staff are putting pools in their backyards. It's got to stop. It's got to stop. Okay, we we're running a little behind, so we'll hear from Christy Lee one more time. Okay. I'll be quick. I just want to say that, like, um, in our ways, it doesn't take us four weeks to flip around a poll and put it up. Like, it takes us a long time. So, like, even the time frames that you give us to, you know, fill out these grants and to get it done by, that's ridiculous. Um, we take it takes time and love and energy and and teams and all that stuff to 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 gather and put it out. Also, um, the application process sometimes is way beyond some like a carver or a painter or whoever you're hiring. It's way beyond their, their reach. Um, I've helped, you know, like Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Foundation flip their um, application process to a five question thing as opposed to a 20 page application. And uh, also doing a, a oral application where they send in a video and also not questioning like if these people need the money or not. I mean, we're artists, this is what we do. Of course we need the money, right? So um, uh, there was one final thing I wanted to say. Yeah, it's okay to make a specific call out to Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil right? We don't have to say like, oh, we have to respect all these. Mm -hmm. We do. We do have to respect everyone. But like when we know whose land we're on and whose territory we're in and, you know, um, we can just say, hey, this money is for either Musqueam, Squamish, or tsleil artists to put it up there. Mm. And um, oh, there was one final point I wanted to make. Oh, just come and ask us. You don't always have to put a call out and then keep extending it and extending it and extending it. Like I said, we know, you know, we have people when we do a gathering, we know who the speaker is we're going to go hire because they're good at this, at speaking. And if they're not available, we go down the line to the next people. So, you know, we don't share everything, but if you come ask and share some tea with us or something, we'll let you know, like, oh yeah, this guy's a carver and this one's a weaver and get paint from them and all that kind of stuff. So it's up to us. Beautiful. Um, I'm just going to briefly speak so much going on here. Um, and as a working artist, uh, I'm just going to briefly speak to my experience of working in Vancouver as someone who is not registered to a community in Vancouver. Um, so in Squahomus, Squahomus Snitchum, Quis on Stop Milk, Elizabeth Atkins, my Stop Milk was Elizabeth Atkins and she was from uh, Squamish. She's Squamish, my great grandmother. She was removed from her family when she married my grandfather because he didn't carry, uh, he wasn't Tukten, um, he didn't carry a mask. And so these things happened. You had to marry through your ancestral rights or you got the boot. Thankfully, these, these things don't happen anymore. Um, but I say like, I have kinship ties to Squamish. And uh, my uncle says I have kinship ties to Musqueam as well, but I do not apply. I do not apply to applications that call out to Musqueam, Slum Squamish, and Slovatooth. And on top of that, if I get a request, a direct request, which I love, I love a direct request. I first ask myself, is this going to get me in hot water with... <laughs> people from Musqueam primarily. Um, and, you know, some people have brand new policies, right? And their brand new policies say someone like myself, who doesn't have a membership in either of these communities, can't put art in the forefront of a building, but I can put it in the back or inside. Me as an artist, as a person, I feel small. I feel belittled. I feel discarded in a way. But... It's important, this is the time we're in. We're in a time of resurgence of the voices and the visions of Musqueam, Squamish, and Slovatooth individuals. Resurgence is important. Do unto others. 
And so I stepped back. And, and I really got my launch pad here in Vancouver with the Vancouver Mural Festival, but they don't knock on my door anymore because they're knowing better and doing better. But if I do get a request for a mural in Vancouver, I know who the neighbors are, who is the Huomo Mestiuch in that place. I pack up a gift, I make a call, I go and I visit somebody. And I, and I, and I say, I have something for you and I have a request. Can I tell your story? Can I tell a story from here? Do you trust me with that? Do you trust me with your story? Fully prepared to hear no. And when I hear no, I back away and I pass those opportunities on to someone else. So it's just, it's just where we're at. It's just what we do. First and foremost, the voices of the ones who are still here. And if I don't live that way, you know, and it affects my pocket. If I don't live that way, I can't speak to it. I have no right speaking to it if I don't live it. So it's difficult. It's complicated. It's complex. But I love clear answers like this. We got to talk to our neighbors. And, you know, we're getting organized slowly but surely. You know, there's, there's organizations within communities who have an open door. Squamish is a great example of that. Their cultural department is flourishing and they're busy and they're coming and going and they're speaking their language and sharing their songs and, and offering their culture. This is not perfect, but it's, it's a start. It's a start of something. So I wanna thank our three panelists here for their openness and their sharing.